All right, ladies, we're going to get going here. We're going to go through uh, Acts chapter number seven today. Exciting stuff. This is probably going to, we're probably going to be here for probably three weeks in the book, of, in Acts seven, I think. Uh, it might be longer. Um, I'm going to kind of jump around, kind of give you the big over picture today, and then we're going to break some of these things down in far more uh, detail, because this is, this is just a very important book and chapter. Acts 7 is very good, lots of stuff to talk about. A um, couple things I kind of want to bring to your attention this week. Um, I had a friend of ours who had a brain aneurysm this week, so that's not good. Um, I talked to her on Tuesday, or I talked to her on Monday. I was at their office, then on Tuesday, I get a call. Hey, can you help me do something real quick? Well, well Marissa had to go to the hospital. I'm like, oh, really? Oh, no, what's going on? They don't really know. She's having really bad headaches and t t tingling and numbness and all that stuff. And then she's had this aneurysm. So she's, she's doing okay. She had the coil done, but, you know, she's in four to 14 days of, you know, potential, you never really know, you have a vasospasm and you die. Uh, then I find out that another friend of mine had an aneurysm as well, and she's basically can never work again. She's going to probably be a vegetable. So I'm like, oh my goodness, it's been aneurysm central here. So uh, know the warning signs of an aneurysm, you know, headache and, and tingling and numbness and all that other stuff. And it's just, I think to myself, man, I've, I've never really had any friends have aneurysms, and this is pretty insane to have two of them. Uh, one of which is a believer, the other one I don't know about. I've not really talked to her in, in much depth. She's more of a, a, a worker of, of uh, one of the offices that I, I visit every once in a while. So very, very sad story, but we'll continue to keep her family and her in prayer as they, as they definitely need this right now. Um, been helpful to, to minister to some of them, and, and uh, they've been needing the verses, that's for sure. I also had a chance to talk this week. I, I do, as I told you, I post on those blogs, and if nobody does it, then, you know, they're no, the truth's never going to get out there. And I don't waste my time, nor do I debate with people, but I do spend some time talking on those blogs that are necessary, and I may address some of those things, because I think a lot of these guys listen to these messages that we preach, so I'm, I'm totally fine with that, and I hope that they continue to do so. But one of the issues that we talked about this week was uh, it was the top, it was the top po post of the, of the week, uh, and it was about a Christian. I use that in quotation marks. He says, uh, you know, I, I had a great experience today, and he says, I was in a taxi cab, and I was driving to my taxi cab, and <clears throat> while I was in there, the, the Arab gentleman that was in front of me uh, kind of looked bummed out, and I was kind of bummed out too, and I said, you having a good day? He's like, nope. And he's like, yeah, me either. I'm having a horrible day. And he's like, yeah, it's just, you know, seems like the devil's out to get me. He makes a statement like that. And the, the, the so-called Christian says, yeah, me too. Devil's out to get me too. He goes, uh, are you a believer? And him being kind of naive, thinking that he was gonna, the guy was going to be a Christian. And he says, oh, yes, yes, very much so. And he goes, great, can I pray with you? And he says, sure. So they go through this whole little prayer for a little bit. And he prays, he says he prays Christ's peace. I don't know, he, I don't know his background, but this guy prays this bunch of random things. And he tells you the whole story. And the reason why they post these things is, number one, to have have other people's input on the situation. And he goes, what do you guys think uh, you know, about the situation? And so, I mean, you're asking me for the, uh, you know, the biblical scriptural approach. And, I mean, he left the guy, basically lost his can be, because the guy afterwards says, oh, no, I'm Muslim. And he goes, oh, I believe in Jesus. And he goes, see, he believes in Jesus. And this is the problem, folks. I mean, if you don't think that it's a problem today that people think that they just believe in Jesus, it's crazy. And, and uh, several Muslims are coming back and fighting us and saying, oh, no, we all believe in Jesus. I said, so I'm gonna, I want you to, to tell me right now that you believe that Jesus is not only the Son of God, but that he's God incarnate. And they say, well, no, he's just a prophet. Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross? No, he, he didn't die on the cross. He's going to come back and tell you that he never died on the cross. So it's really crazy, the stuff that they tell you. So don't believe any of the lies that Muslims believe in Jesus, therefore it's all the same. All is really Jehovah, any of that nonsense. So uh, it was funny because I posted it, and I, had a, I, I usually spend some time talking about it, and I don't just like rant. I, I actually spend time going through, and I probably spend an hour or two of, you know, telling my reply, and I reply back. And uh, it's, it's just amazing to me the amount of people out there who are like, no, no, it doesn't really matter. He, you don't need to communicate the word. It's called lifestyle gospel. Whew, never even heard of this before. Have you heard of lifestyle gospel? I haven't. This is something completely new to me. Lifestyle gospel. You don't need to tell anybody the word. You, you can do words without the word. And I'm like, what? I'm like, if faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, you need to communicate and speak boldly as you ought to speak, you know, ministering grace on the hearers, preaching the ministry of reconciliation and uh, the word of reconciliation. And these guys are just like, no, no, it's not anything about that. You're totally wrong. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, I'm giving you 12 
15 scriptures on this particular subject matter. Hateful. You are so hateful. You are so hateful. That's what they kept telling me. I was hateful. A few people come up, and uh, a couple people who are actually, uh, you know, solid there, but they come up and say, you guys are so crazy. When is the word of God hateful? I mean, come on now. I mean, this guy's telling you that you're trying to help this lost man. I mean, his eyes are lost. He's blind as can be. And I'm like, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. I mean, how do you not see this? Oh, I know. You're blind. You're completely blind and you're unsaved as well. That's what it comes down to. These guys are just saying, no, these, you don't know the heart of this man. He could be saved. I'm like, you're, you're just so bonkers. This guy's telling you he's Muslim, he's Islam. If he holds those tenets, he's not a Christian. And the big, the big came back, comeback was mostly if, uh, if you were b born and raised in a Muslim society, you might, think, you might think the exact opposite of what you think now. You think that Muslim's the only way. Well, they're, they're, they are, but they aren't. They're kind of more inclusive than most, you know. Most religions aren't like Christianity where they're super over, uh, you know, uh, exclusive because they are, they include a lot of other people. Well, that's okay, because they're all a workspace salvation anyways when it comes down to the core of it all. So uh, I just to encourage you guys that this is kind of, the Internet is the new, you know, marketplace for, for, for discussion and for ideas. And so if nobody's going to put the truth out there, then, you know, what goes on? I mean, somebody's got to push it out there. I'd rather at least get it out there, get the verses out, and then leave. I don't sit there and, and get in the debate and argument with these people because it's just not worth my time. But at the same point, it's the, it's the way you can reach people from all over the world in a matter of moments, and they're going to be presented with the truth of God's word. And at the end of the day, that's the word that judges them. And that's what's, I don't, I, what do I do? I can't do anything more about that. I can't convince them that they have to do it. Um, last thing I'll talk about is I, I got this little book. And, you know, Russ always makes this little statement. And he always says, you know, you can make the Bible say anything you want, can't you? You really can. You can make the Bible say whatever you want. You know, as, as the old, as his little joke goes, you know, uh, uh, Judas hung himself, go thou and do likewise, you know. It's, that's the kind of the joke about it. Well, you can take the same thing with this book here. It's very, it's very dangerous. It's called Armed and Dangerous. It is dangerous. The book itself is dangerous. Um, inside here, it goes through, you know, one of the first things I do whenever I read a book, and I don't know if you guys are the same way, but I look at the author, who it is, who's writing the book. I'm not even going to bother reading it if this guy's not saved or if this lady's not saved or, or, or if this person doesn't have a clean testimony, right? And so this individual here, he, he writes for Joel Osteen and a, a bunch of, you know, so you already know where you're going to kind of get, get on this. But uh, so he, his big thing in this book is I'm preparing young people for the answers to life's tough questions from the Bible, no commentary, right? That's what his whole big thing is. There's no commentary in here. There, there's no extra you know, words. It's simply just scripture. Of course, he uses whichever version of the Bible he feels is necessary and feels fit to use. Uh, but let me just go ahead and go through the one that I would start at first, salvation, right? Salvation, that would be a good one. Let's start there. Um, Exodus 15, 2. Okay. The Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God, etc., etc. Okay. Uh, first Chronicles 16, 35. Save us, O God of our salvation, and gather us together and deliver us from heathen, that we may give thanks to thy holy name and glory. Okay. So, this is just, it's just crazy. This is, this is just insane. Uh, Psalm 106, 8, nevertheless, he has saved them from his power. I mean, basically, he's just doing a concordance and putting a bunch of verses in there that he thinks are, okay, just put a bunch of salvation verses in there. Uh, I, you, what I'll tell you is there is no gospel. Uh, there is no salvation. No, for by grace are you saved through faith. You know, no. no that, why would that verse be missing in there, you know? Uh, it just, it just it blows my mind. I mean, it's pretty much, there's only one there's only one verse from Paul's epistles, and I, I share this with Russ, and it's the, therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Well, the simple question is, how do you get in Christ? You know? Uh, so these things are dangerous, and they are. They're super dangerous. These little books, these little pamphlets, all this stuff that, you, you know, you have to really sit there and spend some time understanding who, uh, who the background is and don't take everything. It's from the Christian bookstore. It must be Christian. Uh, wrong answer, you know. I'm seeing more and more that the, the truth of God's word is hidden. It is suppressed. It is held down in unrighteousness. And as a result of it, uh, we have people out there saying everything they want to say, and nobody's got a verse for it. And to say you have a verse for it is just dogmatic. So, all right. Well, that's my, uh, that's my beginning uh, introduction here. But let's turn to Acts chapter number 7. Acts chapter number 7. And let's open in a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, we love you. We thank you for your Son, Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that his salvation is by grace through faith, Lord. Thank you that um, just through all of this, uh, as we continue to grow, uh, if we take the scripture at its word and we, and we trust and rely upon it, Lord, that we can have peace, we can have comfort, we can have hope in it. And as we continue to, to, to grow and, and strengthen the knowledge 
that it will ultimately build us up to where we can defend uh, your word and uh, know where to turn in your Bible. In your son's name we pray. Amen. So Acts chapter number 7. Uh, I'll slow down a little bit. I'm kind of in a, I'm in a, I'm in a hyper mood. We had a really good Bible study on Wednesday, and I was just, Natalie's dad came. I don't know if you guys know Natalie. Natalie's dad came, and uh, he, he said I was a fireball. <laughs> so I don't know if that's a good thing or it's a bad thing, but he's like, oh, he's a fireball. Didn't waste any time. I'm like, good, good. That's what I want to hear. Uh, anyways, so Acts chapter number 7. We concluded last week uh, discussing uh, a man named Stephen, right? Stephen was getting ready to, he was, he was chosen, he was selected to serve the tables, right? And uh, Stephen last week was left standing before the council, right? So the council are these leaders, the leadership of Israel, uh, the scribes, the Pharisees, and these elders and these scribes, they came upon Stephen, and what did they want him to do? Well, they wanted him to, uh, to, to give an account or to make a statement that could then be used against him for blasphemy. That's what they really want. They want him to tell from the, from the horse's mouth, give me the blasphemous words that you stated. You know, we don't want to even just have to rely upon these, these witnesses, but we want to hear it from your mouth, tell us, right? You know, while Stephen was, he was chosen back in Acts chapter 6 to do, to do what? To take care of tables, to take care of the business, but remember, the prerequisites of this job were what? Honest report, as it says there in verse number 3 of chapter 6. You had to be full of the Holy Ghost, and you had to be wisdom. So was, was Stephen overqualified for the job of just serving tables? Well, yeah, maybe, but this job was, as we said, was very important so that the Word of God would in turn be published more so that more and more, more people would be saved and we'd have more converts, right? So... Stephen obviously has some, some knowledge here, and he has some understanding, and he's also one full of the Holy Ghost, to the extent that you know, he, he's going to speak boldly as he ought to speak, and he gets himself into a dispute in chapter 6 with those in the synagogue. If you look at verse number uh, 8 and 9, <clears throat> and Stephen, full of faith, of chapter 6, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 9, then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and of them of Cilicia and of Asia, disputing with Stephen, right? So they're having a dispute, and then what happens with this dispute as you look in verse number 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. So that's what the truth does of God's word. It, it does pierce, it does devour, it takes people over because they really have no other choice but to uh, uh, really admit that it is true. They, they have to do what? They have to turn to, to lies. And that's what they do here in Acts chapter number 6 is, well, let's go find some people to make a false witness against Stephen, similar to what they did to Christ, and we're going to look at that in just a moment. So as a result of this dispute, he gets delivered up to the council, and he's presented here with, with really what? I mean, isn't it the perfect opportunity for him to be able to tell the higher-ups exactly what it is that he wants them to hear? I mean, now you're getting the opportunity to be brought up right to the men and women who are men that lead this, uh, this, this, uh, 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 this nation, the council, the high priest. And they're going to they're gonna ask him to give an account, to answer. And here, what does he get to do? He gets to talk to him about Christ. He's a, he's a witness of the resurrection, the power of Christ. And ultimately right now, I mean, uh, reading in Acts chapter 7, we'll see that really, I, I've been talking about this with Russ, and we, I, don't, I don't think that there is an option here for, for repentance. If you notice in the passage, it's, it's not given to them there. He just says, you know, here's how it is, and then he ends it with, you know, verse number 50, uh, 51 where he calls them those stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, right? So, I mean, he really berates these guys. This is what I would call a rebuke, and I'm going to show you why I believe it's a rebuke, comparing it with Christ. So again, Stephen is clearly a man of faith, as the scripture states, and, he's, and he obviously is a learned Jew. He undoubtedly uh, sees the nation's position as being one that is in turmoil, in trouble, and uh, their position uh, in relation to God is, is one of enmity, right? So the charges against Stephen as we said, is blasphemy, our blasphemy. So blasphemous words are a capital crime. So what is a capital crime in the United States today? Murder. murder. What type of murder in particular is a capital crime? First degree murder, right? Capital crime. What, used to, what also used to be a capital crime? Does anybody know? Adultery. Adultery used to be a capital crime a long time ago. Treason. Uh, we had rape. Rape used to be a capital crime. So did 
uh, sexual molestation of children. That used to be a capital crime. It's actually still called sexual, uh, capital sexual battery. It's still called that, capital sexual battery. But the Supreme Court overturned and said you can't, we can't kill people for sexual battery you know, on children, which, okay, so they end up, they end up changing the, the, the sentencing to life. But at the same point, it's still called capital sexual batteries. It's still one of the worst, most heinous crimes you could do to an innocent child. Well, here the charges of blasphemy uh, stem back to the Levitical law. And they knew, the, the priests knew, they knew that this is one of the ones that we can get them on. Uh, and it, and it is, a, it is a, a crime that is kind of more easy to prove because we can get people to lie about it, right? And if he teaches doctrine that's contrary to what we teach, then we can say he's blaspheming. So if you read in, in the passages here, Verse number 10 says of chapter 6, And they were not able to resist the wisdom in the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, right? They tried to bribe men. They got men that they chose and said, Hey, will you guys lie about this? We need you to raise up false witnesses. And he says, that, which, which said what? We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses. Right? So that shows their priority. I always like that because that's the first thing to talk about. Moses. That's who they love to identify with, but they don't even know Moses. For as Christ says, if you, if you even read Moses' words, if you understood Moses' words, you know who I am because Moses talked about me. You know? But they're just so blind. They're just so, they're so uh, foolish right now. And then he says, and against God. And they stirred up the people to get everybody else together. And the elders and scribes came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses which said, this man ceaseth, ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. So the, the four things are what? Moses, they're speaking blasphemous words against Moses. Blasphemous words against God. Blasphemous words against the, the holy place, the temple, and then also the law. The Jews understood and knew that blasphemy was one of the key ways to get people put to death, hence Christ, right? In, uh, in John 19, 7, uh, look at 19, 7 with me, John 19, 7. We're going to make a comparison here between Stephen and Christ. John 19, 7. When Pilate is, is talking to them about whether or not he's going to crucify him, he says, like, I find no fault in him. And they tell him to take ye him and crucify him in verse 6, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law. What law are they talking about there? Leviticus chapter number 24. We have a law. And the law states, you kill the blasphemer. Look what it says. And by our, our law, he ought to die. And why is that? Because he made himself the son of God. God made himself the son of God. But, and as they saw this, of course, uh, Herod, was, Herod was more afraid of this issue here. Well, as we looked at the specifics of Leviticus 24 last week. If you, didn't, if you weren't here, you can just note it down or listen to the message. But blasphemy by a member of the nation of Israel or an outsider, capital offense, and as a result, it is to be punishable by death. Well, one of the issues here that we're looking at is, is, a, is a witness issue. We're trying to find witnesses against this man because the more we have, it's called in the, in the legal realm, we would call it credibility. The more witnesses that you have, the more credible it's going to be that the charges against you are true. So here, they're trying to get as many as they possibly can. So look at Acts 7, verse number 1. Uh, let's close this out. He says, verse 14, For we have heard him say that, the, that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us. And all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. <clears throat> so we talked last week about when, when Moses came down from the mount and Aaron and everybody else saw him, they did what? They were afraid at his face because they recognized, man, wow, this is, this is something that's supernatural. Uh, and then you see here in verse number 1 of chapter 7, then the high priest, then said the high priest, are these things so? So what I want to do is I want to kind of compare Stephen and his account here in Acts 7 with the Lord Jesus Christ in Matthew chapter number 26. Because these two parallels here are, are just, it's amazing to see uh, pre-crucifixion and pre-resurrection Christ statements, what he says, and then how Stephen's going to affirm what Christ has been stating, but then not only that, give them the rebuke that they really uh, do need, right? So the priest here, he's looking in Acts chapter 7, he's looking for what we would call an admission. And if you get an admission uh, in, in a criminal case, it's, it's basically, it's the best thing you could possibly get. You know, in, in criminal law, you have the right to remain silent, right? And, and as a prosecutor, you know, prosecuting somebody who's committed a crime, I have no ability to tell, to tell the jury 
that, you know, oh, well, uh, you know, the defendant today will tell you about X, Y, and Z. No, I can't say that. Why? Because he's, he has the right to remain silent. And if you say those things, it's instantaneously a mistrial, and that defendant goes free. So if you don't think for a second, those prosecutors, think about a prosecutor. That is one of the most difficult job scripts to know exactly what to say, when you can say it. If you say one thing wrong, oops, mistrial, done, and then phew, that guy goes scot-free. And it happens more often than not. You'd be surprised. People that go away uh, or get, get, get off that should have gone away because of a technical error. That's the, the beauty of the legal system in that we make it very particular that you want the rights of that individual to be protected. But if, if there's an individual who's going to testify that's not the defendant about something that the defendant said, completely fine. It's not hearsay. We, it's, it's an exception because we call it an admission by a party opponent. So hearsay is an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. And as a result, let's say um, a police officer or a friend heard the defendant say, yeah, I'm going to kill him and I'm going to kill him good, right? Okay, well, I can say in my opening statement that, and you're here today from, from an individual who heard the defendant state, I'm going to kill him and I'm going to kill him good, you know? And that's, and that's something you get to use. Well, those admissions are also the most damning, aren't they? Because if you get somebody from his own mouth that's going to say this, or if you get a recording or a video, that's the best, when you get a video or a recording of this person making an admission, what else do you really have to prove, you know? Let me play you the video today, members of the jury. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to kill him. You know? Okay, stop it. Anybody else want to have anything else to say? Nope, okay, well, let's move on. And those are the easiest cases. Because when you have an admission, it, it gets rid of all of the credibility arguments. It gets rid of all the issues of, oh, well, perhaps this maybe, this maybe isn't necessarily true. We need more evidence to, to prove it up, to offer it. So here with Stephen, they're doing what? They're trying to get multiple witnesses. Because the more witnesses you have, as their law states, the matter should be done with two or three witnesses. Look at, uh, look at Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. Here's just one example. Uh, we have a lot of them, but hold your place in, in Matthew 26. But... <clears throat> Matthew chapter 18, verse 16. This is just going about the same way, same issues of, of, uh, of proving a matter. And it's kind of like, it's kind of very similar for us too today in the, in, the, in the legal world. We're always looking for more witnesses. But it says the following, um, but if you will not hear thee, then take with thee t then the one or two more that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word uh, may be established, right? So getting more witnesses is all the better. And if you actually look back, even at the Old Testament, we go through some of those verses on there. But let's make the comparison here between Matthew chapter 26 and Acts chapter number 7, keeping in mind those things we talked about with admissions and keeping in mind those things <clears throat> that we talked about with regards to the witnesses. 26, starting in verse number 59, right? Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought False witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Okay, make these comparisons between Stephen in Acts 7 and Christ here in Matthew chapter number 26, verse 59. Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witnesses against Jesus to put him to death. Similar to, to, to Stephen? Yep, we're seeing comparisons here, seeing similarities here. But what's the issue here? Verse 60, but found none. Well, of course, it's going to be really hard to find false witnesses against Christ because I mean, he's doing all these miracles, he's doing all these things, and many people are, are kind of like, oh, we're kind of looking at him in, in a way that uh, we don't really want to speak ill against him. But what do they end up doing? He says, uh, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. So it took them a little bit to find two false witnesses. It was a little easier to find two false witnesses against Stephen. It took them a little bit more difficult to hear to find uh, two against Christ. Verse number 61, and said, so here's what these false witnesses are stating, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. Holding your place here, go back to Acts chapter number 7. Is this not the same issue that they're still holding on to? They're still harping on with Stephen? Look at Acts chapter 7, or 6, I'm sorry, verse number uh, 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place. Okay, so they're concerned about that. Obviously, Christ here has also talked about the temple being his body, and then he's going to raise it again in three days, uh, not also discussing the prophecy of the destruction of the temple uh, later on. But verse number 62, And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee. So, come on. Give your defense. Verse 63. 
But Jesus held his peace. What's it mean to hold your peace? It means you, you didn't bite back. You just said, hold my peace. And he says, And the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Think about that just for a second. You have this high priest in a position of, of, of authority trying to tell God Almighty, I adjure thee by God Almighty to answer me and tell me, right? Tell me, tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. So Jesus still holding his peace to, the, to a certain extent makes the following statement. He says, Jesus saying to him, thou hast said. You know, he's really like, thou hast said. You know, that's, yeah. You said right. And look what the next statement he says. Nevertheless, I say unto you, hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. That's a burner right there. What is their response? It's a very similar response to the response of Stephen. So I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit, but this will help you get a better understanding. There's a lot of historical things that happen in Acts 7 that we're going to go through, but we need to kind of get the big picture as to where we end up, because that will help you uh, get the pictures and types that Stephen's using in this. So keep your place in Matthew 26 and go back over to, to uh, Acts 7. So this, this is here is telling you that the second coming is a visible event. It's an it's a open event. People do see the second coming, right? And he says you'll see the Son of Man uh, sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. But look at the response here, right? The response here is what? Then the high priest rent his clothes, <laughs> ripped them off, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses. So you see what I was telling you about that admission? I mean, when I start reading the Bible, and I studied it in comparison to the law that I've already studied, I go, I see where we get our law from. I mean, this is where it comes from. I told you that example of my professor who told me that negligence was something that just happened after the Industrial Revolution, and I said, no, you just decided to call it negligence then. The principles were back here with Israel, and we already see it back here. You know, when God gave the law. And uh, he was very, like, I never had anybody bring that up before. But it's true. And it's funny because we talk about Levitical law. I mean, when I used to read my opening books, especially on any, any real subject, especially if it's a subject matter which involves crimes against people, there would always be a subject on moral law. Like, it would always go there. And, and you would think that many would be, many legal, many, many legal uh, uh, jurisprudence books and things like that, they, they for the most part, the older ones, totally, especially ones 14, 15, 16, 17, 1800s, they all will, will admit that there's a moral law and that there's a God. Now, the more you read them now, it's so funny because it's just so stupid you read it, and they're just like, well, society over time has dictated that to do to do to do And I'm like, well, no, society really hasn't dictated. We haven't really changed very much. We still hold to the same moral tenets that we held all, all along. We just we become a little more lax in some regards and a little more strict if it makes us more money in our pockets. But th those, those issues of morality always go back to improve the existence of a God because if there's good, then there has to be evil. If there's evil, there has to be good. And where did that all come from and why do we have a moral law? So uh, those are things that C.S. Lewis wrote about, and that's one of the reasons why he really came to faith was that issue of just seeing moral law and going, well, how, how, do, we, how do we determine this? How do we work through this? Well, the issue here is that blasphemy, and he says, what further need we have of witnesses? So once you have that admission, it's like, well, who cares if we have witnesses? We got it from his mouth. There's the admission, and it's in front of all of us. So I don't need to prove anything else anymore, right? He says, behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy, Matthew 26, verse 65. You've heard it. You've heard the blasphemy. We're not just trying to prove it now with what these false witnesses are saying. We have him from his own mouth telling us that he's going to be the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power, coming in the clouds of heaven. And they obviously understood some of that, meaning that there was going to be an issue of, of Christ coming. So they're like, okay, well, that's blasphemy because we, don't, we definitely don't think that you're the Son of God. You made yourself to be the Son of God. Well, Look at verse uh, number 54 of, of Acts chapter number 7. Let's actually start in 51. 
after Stephen goes through and gives his big, long dissertation, which we are going to dissect, I just don't want to, I want to give you the big picture to help you out. Verse 51, he says, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, you do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets have, your, have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which have showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and the murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. When they, when they heard these things, when they heard the word of God being preached through the mouth of Stephen, they were cut to the heart. I have written next to this Hebrews 4.12. Every example I have of somebody preaching the word of God and it cuts people to the heart, this is the, this is the, the several times we've had this already. Uh, Acts chapter number 5, when, when, and look at Acts chapter number 5 verse 31. Peter says, Him hath God exalted, speaking of Christ with his right hand to be a prince and a savior for to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses of these things and so is also the Holy Ghost whom God hath given to them that obey him. When they heard that, they were cut to the heart and took counsel to slay them. So same issue here. They're, they're not even just taking counsel. They're not just getting cut to the heart. They're, they're going to go through with this. They're getting so angry, so frustrated that, that they're just going to let the devil walk right all over them and take them captive of his will and, and do what they need to do. So look at this with me here. And he says, when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly in, into heaven and saw the glory of God in Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now make a comparison here, and I want to make sure this is really clear, that Christ was not going to come back at this point in time. At Bible study this week, we had several who were saying, oh, Christ is going to come back right here, right now. Well, he couldn't have come back. There's, there's so much prophetic elements that have to have taken place before then. He was standing up in judgment, but he wasn't going to come back and, and, and okay, here we go, I'm, I'm here, I'm ready to set up my kingdom. Well, where's all the earthquakes and all the other things in Matthew 24 that have to take place? You know, So that stuff has to occur, has to happen. Uh, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before that great notable day of the Lord, Acts chapter number um, 2. So you, you follow me where we're going here on this and how this is kind of the, the progression of things? So look what he says here. But he being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, if you compare this back with, with Matthew chapter 26, I think this is why some people get a little confused. They think, oh, look, here, here it is. He's going to come right back right now. Well, prophetically, he can't. You know, Paul, or Peter says that we have to have the restitution of all things spoken by the mouth of all of his holy prophets since the world began, and he has to have that happen before he will send Jesus, whom we preached unto you, right? Does that make sense? That's what's going to have to happen before this can occur. So uh, this coming in the clouds of heaven, of course, these same people, note this, these same people here that are in, in Matthew chapter 26, the high priest and, and, and the council, uh, this isn't but a year, you know, from here. You follow me? So we're still within a year's period of time. These guys are, most of them are going to still be alive and they're going to be here at the same exact thing. So they know what Christ has said to them. And now they hear what Stephen's saying to them in a matter of rebuke. And what do they do? Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord. Why? Why were they so mad about this? Because they thought, well, no, we're not going to let this happen. We'll just go ahead and kill you. By killing you, we'll try to stop it. And I've been studying that issue here with the blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, and that's it. I mean, this is where it comes in. It's blasphemy of the Son of Man. Look, that's going to be forgiven them, because obviously it has to. We see that in the beginning of the book of Acts. Right there, it's, it's forgiven them. But that blasphemy of the Holy Ghost, pff, nope, not going to be forgiven any of you guys. Not going to happen. Nope, no way, no how. So look what he says. Keep going here. He says, then they cried with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. This is where we get that introduction. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. Just like how Christ says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Very similarly, Stephen makes that same statement of, Lord, lay, lay not this into their charge. And so, so what was Christ doing in that standing? Well, Isaiah chapter 3 discusses that the Lord stands to judge. And when he stands up, he's ready to begin and start going through with, with the judgment, right? He's given him the year of extension here, and he's like, look, this is rebuke. Think about this for a second. The Lord held his peace. All he says is, thou hast said that I'm the Christ. And he goes, you're going to see the Son of Man coming. 
And that really frustrated him. They called him blasphemy. And, but he did. He held his peace. He didn't give him the riot act like you're going to see here in Acts 7. Stephen, on the other hand, in the beginning of here of Acts chapter number 7, verse number 1, then said the high priest, are these things so? What's he going to do? Is he going to hold his peace like Christ did? Nope. Not even in the least bit. Because we have to remember that Christ did have to die. Right? He had to be resurrected in accordance with the scriptures. Prophecy had to be fulfilled, and it did. It was, it was fulfilled. So now that this has all been fulfilled, and that they're rejecting Christ, and they're rejecting Stephen again, Christ is like, look, it's fine. I'm going to give you the rebuke of your life right here, right now. And we're going to begin with the father of it all, Father Abraham. Because you guys all know who Father Abraham is, unless you forgot who Father Abraham is. Did, did you guys forget Father Abraham? And he's going to remind them that those who forget the past are doomed or condemned to repeat it. And that's the whole issue of, of, of Acts chapter number 7. Look, you always resist him. You're always having this problem. You keep doing this. Don't you see? Can't you see? But that's the issue. They can't see. Why? They're so blind. Look with me at Isaiah uh, chapter number 28. Isaiah chapter number 28. Look at uh, chapter number 28, verse 11. And we're going to make, make, think about this now in relation to Acts chapter number 2. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people, to whom he said... This is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest. And this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. Right? Remember the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord? Remember these verses? Remember these words that are starting to come through? This is what you do. as you. The more you study God's word, it just starts going pieces together, as long as you're rightly dividing it, as long as you're understanding who Israel is versus the body of Christ, prophecy versus mystery, this stuff just falls together perfectly, succinctly. And he says, yet they would not hear. What wouldn't they hear? But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. What happens when you don't listen to the word of God? Those things happen to you when you don't listen to the word of God. In John chapter number 18, verse 6, I'll just read that to you real quick. Uh, Jesus, knowing all things that should come upon him, verse 4, that should come upon him, went forth and saith unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with him. As soon, as, they, as, soon, as soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. I mean, think about some of these things that are coming to pass in relation to like Isaiah. They might go, they fall backward. I mean, I'm just, this, is, this is stuff that we're, we're kind of uh, branching off and going through. But these words that are used here, Paul uses these same words. He says, fall backwards, be broken, snared, taken. And who are they taken by? By the devil. Look at 2 Timothy chapter number 2. We'll close with this. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, we know that, we know the famous 2 Timothy 2.15. You know, study to show this self approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But let's keep reading just for a second and get the understanding here of what, of what the issue is, why he's telling them to do this too. 2 Timothy chapter number 2, verse 15, he says, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. So he's telling about the word of truth versus the, the word of truth that uh, comes from this. He says, but shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. And here's what he tells them. He says, in their word will eat as doth a canker. So he's discussing particular words, and he talks about these people, Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. And so what's the error of their truth? What did they think? Well, they thought the resurrection, if you look at... Um, some of the stuff in Isaiah 26 with relation to Matthew chapter uh, uh, 22 and 27 uh, relating to when Christ was um, killed, people came up, you know, the saints were raised up, and they went out and walked around. And people were thinking, well, that must be the resurrection, you know, because that happened. That was the resurrection. That was it. It's already, it's already happened, right? 
And that's what they're airing. So they're, what are they doing as a result of that? They overthrow the faith of some. And so he goes through all these things. And then look at verse number 23. He says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be, must, be, must be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. Does the nation of Israel oppose themselves? Absolutely. He says, If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, which happens through his word, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will, right? I mean, we see the word snared here back in Isaiah. We see them being taken. And, and what does it ultimately come down to? I mean, why, why is this that they, that they do these things? Um, I think if you look at, uh, let me give this, let me give you two passages and so we'll close. Uh, Matthew 13, verse number 15. Matthew 13, verse number 15. As Stephen said, you know, which of the, which of the, which of the uh, prophets, he says, which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted, Acts 7, 52, and they have slain them, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, and look what he says here in verse number 15 of chapter 13 of Matthew. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Notice the word, they have closed. They did it to themselves. How? By going in and being captive by the devil. They went in and volitionally did it at their own free will. And he says, they have closed. Listen, at any time, they should see with their eyes. And what do they be seeing? They be seeing the signs. They be seeing Stephen, full of the Holy Ghost, shining you know, as he's giving this message to them. And he says, they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears. They hear the word of God. That's the word that cuts them to the heart and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. I mean, Mark 4, verse 12 is, is a parallel passage. And he says, lest at any time I should forgive their sins. Acts chapter number 28 is also a parallel passage in verse number 27. Similar parallel passages on this. So what we see here is, is we're going to go through next week, and we're kind of give you the, the, the understanding here what Stephen's going to do. He's going to give him a big rebuke, and he's going to start off with Father Abraham, and it's cool that he does that. But as we, as we study these things, he does it in a particular way because he says, let's start with Abraham, and let's start with the covenants, and let's start with the promises that he made with him. And did God fulfill those covenants and promises? Yep. Does, does God ever not fulfill his word? Does everything he say come to pass and it's true? So why would this be any different, you know? And he's really going to give him. We'll look at, uh, at Joseph as a type of Christ, look at uh, Moses as a type of Christ, and hopefully uh, this passage will probably take a few weeks to get through, but uh, I think it'll be pretty helpful to the greater understanding of, the, of the, really the fall of Israel here. So uh, let's close in a prayer.